Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for joining us here today at the Mayflower, and welcome to all of you tuning in uh, via the live stream. I'm Nate Kazmarek, uh, Vice President and Director of the Federal Society's Practice Groups. Our program today is co-sponsored by the Federal Society's Environmental Law and Property Rights Practice Group and the Regulatory Transparency Project. Uh, thank you to the leadership of both of these groups, and I want to express uh, specific gratitude to RTP's director, Steve Schaefer, and his team for their work in advance of this event. If you'd like to learn more about RTP, please visit their website, regproject.org. That's R-E-G project.org. Our topic today is federal permitting reform, now or never. Uh, despite modest billing from Congress more than 50 years ago and a promise that it would require, quote, only procedural requirements on federal agencies, uh, some critics assert that the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, has become, quote, the most expensive and least effective environmental law in the history of the United States. But after more than half a century, are, these, are there signs that meanif meaningful reforms are in the offing. To answer this question and to discuss the state of federal permitting, we've gathered an excellent panel and we're grateful to each of you for being here today. Uh, complete bios for all of our speakers are, uh, have been supplied uh, to you on our website and the emails uh, in advance of the program. So I will give a quick introduction of our moderator and then turn the program over to him. Jonathan Brightbill is the former Acting Assistant Attorney General for the en Environment and Natural Resources Division of the United States Department of Justice. He is a uh, very accomplished and experienced trial and appellate lawyer with years of litigation in many important federal government cases. I would also note for our audience that his long track record includes a federal enforcement action against Jeffrey Lowe, AKA the Tiger King, who you may recall from our pandemic lockdown when uh, all of us had nothing better to watch on TV. John is a partner at Winston & Strong, where he is the chair of their Environmental Litigation Enforcement Practice Group. He is an adjunct professor at the Georgetown University Law Center. He clerked for Judge D. Brooks Smith on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. His law degree is from Georgetown, and his undergraduate, undergraduate is from the Wharton School. As I thurn, uh, turn things over to John, a reminder to our audience that we will take questions at the end of the panel. So please think of the questions that you'd like to ask them in advance. A gentle note that the dictionary defines a question as a sentence in the form of an interrogative addressed to someone in order to get information in reply. So no speeches, please. With that, please join me in welcoming our panel. All right, great. Is this working? Microphone working? Mine is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Well, thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you to the Federalist Society for hosting uh, and sponsoring this event. My name is Jonathan Brightbill. And uh, uh, in addition to the things that uh, Nate mentioned, I'm also hot off a DC Circuit argument yesterday where I was arguing that uh, agency uh, authority should directly impact and limit the exp uh, extent of of uh, NEPA review uh, as it relates to the Department of Energy and the public citizen line of cases. And that's hopefully something that we're going to see a bit more of coming out of uh, congressional reforms and some of the some of the issues we're going to talk about here today. So um, it's my pleasure to moderate today's discussion of a panel of complete uh, and total experts uh, on this issue and uh, professionals, all of whom I've known uh, for many years. Many in the United States agree that some form of environmental permitting uh, reform is necessary and in order to support economic development, uh, energy, modernize our dated infrastructure of, uh, of, of many years. And each of our panelists here are going to give a brief five to eight minute uh, overview of a different component. We're going to look at uh, where we've been, uh, where we are, and then we're going to ask for some insights on where things may be going at this point. And then we're going to go to question and answer about the various changes, both statutory as well as regulatory, that are proposed uh, and how they may or may not impact environmental permitting and uh, into the future. So to jump right in, I'm going to uh, introduce 
the Honorable Mary Newmeyer, former chairman of the Council of Environmental Quali Quality. Uh, Mary is the Director of Government Affairs at Urenco USA, uh, and in 2019, uh, in January, she was confirmed by the United States Senate as chairman of CEQ. After an extensive career that included many, many important positions at CEQ, on the Committee on Energy and Commerce with the U.S. House of Representatives, at the Department of Justice, at the Department of Energy, and beyond. So under Mary's leadership, CEQ developed and promulgated in 2020 the first significant modernization of the government's NEPA regulations in decades. And uh, Mary, the floor is yours first for a bit on where we've been. Great, thank you, and thank you so much for the invitation, and nice to see everyone today. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about, uh, about uh, the past, uh, where we've been. Um, I, when I think about NEPA, I think about actually when I first came to Washington, D.C. to work for the Department of Justice, and um, within about a month of arriving, and this was in 2003, uh, I learned that I would be going to NEPA training school, uh, that there was a program at the University of South Carolina that many of the uh, government attorneys would attend because NEPA was such a... Uh, such a significant statute for the federal government and because there was so much litigation at, at DOJ relating to NEPA. So I, I went down to that conference and I recall being receiving a, a couple of binders of material with case law and, and the regulations for NEPA. And um, I remember that you know even after reading the regulations, it was very difficult to understand kind of really what the process uh, required, what it involved. Um, uh, what triggered reviews, et cetera. So um, I remember that very distinctly from my uh, earliest time uh, uh, at the Justice Department. And uh, over time, I did work at the Department of Energy and in other contexts began to learn more about NEPA and what the agencies have been doing to implement NEPA. But um, not all of that was really written down. And um, so when I came to uh, the Council on Environmental Quality and um, uh, was asked about um, uh, potentially doing an update to the regulations. We, we thought very much about what we might do and how we might do it. Uh, in, in, in fact, um, the regulations have been issued in 1978 pursuant to an executive order that had been um, issued by President Carter. And the purpose of the uh, uh, regulations was to reduce paperwork and delay. And so this was back in 1977. So the regulations were, were developed um, in, for that purpose. Um, they actually had not been updated in any way except for one very limited substantive revision in 1986. Uh, there had been, however, um, hundreds or thousands of cases issued over the, the intervening period. There had been over 30 guidance documents that the Department had issued, that the Council of Environmental Quality had issued. Uh, there had been actions taken by Congress in terms of statutes. There had been uh, executive orders and presidential memos about how we might expedite uh, environmental <clears throat> reviews. Uh, but there, it continued to really be an issue, uh, the complexity of the process, um, the challenge to navigating the process. And so uh, we uh, decided to undertake a, initially a review within the agencies. Uh, one thing about NEPA that's different from other uh, rulemakings is that NEPA applies to every agency. Every agency has a strong interest in it. Everyone who has worked on NEPA uh, has and has had experience with it has views about how it, it is being implemented, how it could be improved. So we conducted a, a, a very extensive intra-agency process in, I think, the 2017-2018 timeframe. We then did an advance notice of proposed rulemaking and invited public comment. We received over 12,000 comments from the public, many very detailed. Uh, we then uh, moved forward with a proposed rule, which we issued in um, January of 2020. Uh, uh, we received over a million comments, uh, which we reviewed and commented on and, and responded to, uh, and ultimately finalized our rule. But the overall approach that we took uh, with the proposed rule and with the final rule was really to try to take a very pragmatic approach, update the regulations so that they were understandable, that they uh, explained what the process was, when, when NEPA was required, what level of review uh, was required. Uh, as I think many of you know, there are, uh, are environmental impact statements, which the statute um, 
talks about, um, but there are also environmental assessments that are done and something called categorical exclusions, which actually wasn't really addressed at all in the regulations. So uh, we tried to explain the process, explain what levels of review would be required under what circumstances, and then we tried to update the regulations to also codify some of the major uh, case law. There had been 17 Supreme Court decisions and then hundreds or thousands of, of uh, appellate and district court opinions that had been issued. Uh, so we, we sought to codify some of the key case law, including public citizen, uh, uh, and uh, we also sought to update the regulations to reflect agency practice because it had really evolved over the last 40 years. And uh, our goal was to try to have regulations which would could be read by someone uh, uh, attending a conference on NEPA implementation <laughs> and could be understood. And uh, could also, most importantly from my perspective, um, having worked in the executive branch um, be understandable to uh, the officials who need to carry out the and implement the uh, implement the statute and conduct the reviews and it's also important for the applicants and all of the other participants in the process and so we tried to uh, explain the process clarify the process codify agency practice and uh, key case law and also uh, provide uh, revisions to help make the process more efficient. And um, one of the things that we um, did focus on, which Congress has subsequently codified, was uh, really the management of the process. So um, we established presumptive uh, time limits and page limits. Uh, we uh, called for participation by senior agency officials so that there would be um, uh, um, uh, uh, accountability and and um, and real guidance and supervision for the agencies as they implemented NEPA, and um, and and also included other provisions to help facilitate a process where there wasn't so much duplication, so much excessive paperwork. There was reliance on work that had been done previously, and um, and there was also use of more modern technologies. So, so. Uh, that was our objective, that was our goal. Uh, we wanted to have regulations that, that could be understood and were practical and could be implemented by the agencies. So uh, that's, that's how we approached it. And um, Great. Well, thank you very much, Mary. So into the present we go, and uh, as a little bit of a setup, uh, the, in the present we obviously have, as you mentioned, the the uh, Fiscal Responsibility Act, including the Builder Act per portion, has come into effect. It was passed by Congress in June of this year, June of 2023, and now the Council of Environmental Quality has a two-part regulatory uh, uh, review going on, part phase one of, their, of, the, of the new CEQ, the new administration CEQ, uh, went into effect, and they now have a proposed rule out there. So to talk more about where we are today, on environmental energy permitting and the like. I'm now gonna turn things over to uh, and introduce the Honorable James Danley, Commissioner of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, Commissioner Danley was confirmed by the United States Center, uh, Senate as Commissioner on, uh, in uh, uh, 2020, and he served as Chairman of FERC from November 5th, 2020 until January 21st, 2021. Uh, he also previously served as General Counsel of FERC and was an attorney in the Energy Regulation and Litigation Group at Skadden Arps. As a uh, former law clerk of Judge Danny Boggs of the Sixth Circuit, he's also a uh, U.S. Army uh, veteran who served in Iraq, receiving a Bronze Star and Purple Heart. So, Commissioner Danley, the floor is yours to discuss where we are. So, where we are, where we are from the standpoint of anybody who wants to see infrastructure developed is bad. There, the, 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 despite the fact that we have inerrant case law from uh, the, the earlier history of NEPA as being a solely procedural statute that this, uh, in fact, one of the cases famously says it has substantive goals but only procedural requirements. As time has gone on, the courts have uh, effectively been able to exercise what amounts to a judicial branch veto on the executive branch agency's decisions to issue permits. Uh, this comes down to one particular feature of the implementation of NEPA, which is that the standard of review for any decision that comes out, any record of decision, is uh, uh, arbitrary and capricious review, which in the eyes of two out of three members of uh, an appellate panel can uh, amount to virtually 
any, any error or shortcoming, no matter how minor or, or uh, uh, insignificant, can be sufficient for a reversal. And so you can have an agency conduct its best efforts producing thousands of pages of EIS review and material and analysis for the, for the draft and then take serious uh, interest in all of the comments that come in and respond to all of them. And there need be only uh, the decision by an appellate court that, oh, you almost got it, good try, you were almost there, but you didn't luxuriate enough in this single point, and so we need to remand this back for you to have another crack at it. And you see this happening with um, infrastructure across the country being developed. I, of course, as a commissioner at FERC, have a particular interest in the energy infrastructure, transmission lines, uh, natural gas pipelines, LNG terminals, which are jurisdictional to the commission. But um, it applies everywhere. And one of the results that has uh, become more and more problematic is that as these litigation risks continue and as the case law uh, allowing a wider ambit for uh, uh, successful challenges accretes, the, the risk premium that the developers of this infrastructure have to uh, add to any po possible project that they're going to propose becomes so stultifying that it is impossible in many industries to rationally allocate capital. And, and it, is, it has gotten to the point where you have the, 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 the debt of going concerns downgraded repeatedly to the point where they can't raise money on commercially viable terms. You have, uh, um, uh, uh, in, in certain sectors, uh, 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 something amounting to a genuine fear of even proposing the idea of, of greenfield projects because the litigation risk is so great. And, and the, the, the issue fundamentally is that when you continuously expand the scope of the review that the agencies are required to engage in, an example of that would be just what is foreseeability, right? We have uh, <laughs> warring <laughs> case law right now on the subject, even split decisions within circuits in which the public citizen jurisdictional lines are either uh, respected or not. Is this a reasonably foreseeable thing as that? And you have completely inconsistent law, even within circuits on the matter. Um, it, it becomes almost impossible to assess the, the amount of lit litigation risk you're going to have on the back end. So you can make it all the way through what was supposed to be the hard part of the process, which is the, the review, and then it turns out that everything comes down to what happens in the courts. And being able to exercise what amounts to, as I said, a jurisdictional veto, or excuse me, a judicial veto over the executive branch decisions has become terribly problematic. Now, where we are also, uh, going back to my point about if you're somebody who wants infrastructure developed, most of the daggers that have been honed in this uh, litigation over the last, let's say, 10 years or so, 15 years, have been, um, in many cases, focused often on, on uh, fossil fuel in, uh, infrastructure like natural gas pipelines, for example. But we're having a moment right now in which uh, we have a, a very large push, a frenzy, I would say, in some cases a reckless frenzy, to build out uh, electric transmission. Uh, this is being driven in no small part by the fact that there are hundreds of billions of dollars in production tax credits that are just waiting to be harvested by various renewables developers, all of whom are going to require huge quantities of transmission built in order to interconnect to the bulk electric system. And so there is now a moment of convergence in which two different um, uh, constituencies see a real uh, a need for uh, alteration to the, to the implementation of NEPA. Now, we did have, as you say, the Builder Act, which attempted to uh, uh, amend, well, it didn't attempt to amend, it did amend uh, NEPA. Um, there is a, a, a certain phrase in the amendment that says the agency action, which I and I think you would argue reduces the scope of exactly what is to be considered, uh, not an explicit codification of, of, the, of the public citizen case. Public citizen, for anybody who doesn't know, says that if you, have, if you as the agency have no power to effect, if you're not the legal proximate cause of an effect, you're under no obligation to consider that in your review because it can't meaningfully inform the decision that you're about to make. NEPA is meant to inform the decision maker of the consequences of the proposed action. Uh, it, not an explicit codification, but I would argue that that's what it is. There were a handful of other, I would call them marginal changes, things like time limits and page limits, neither of which I think are a good idea. I think those are terrible ideas because as the courts allow more opportunity for attacks on uh, uh, the, the issuances of the agencies to succeed and more parties participate in proceedings, you must by necessity have more opportunity for rebuttal 
when comments come in, and uh, creating page limits effectively means that the agency has to, to fight with one hand tied behind its back. It's strange for, for somebody with my background and my position to be arguing that we need more pages, but, but certainly constraining agencies is counterproductive in this case. But the Builder Act had um, an effect that we have yet to see. It's being implemented, uh, uh, let's say, uh, unevenly across government, even though it's in effect right now. And there is uh, continued renewed interest in further uh, uh, changes to NEPA. I would argue that unless we change the standard of review or simply consign NEPA entirely to the agency's discretion in a matter of law, rendering it unreviewable, we're not, we're not going to get over the real problem we have, which is this veto on what in some cases appears to be almost protectual grounds. And, and, and that, that stultification of the development of infrastructure is going to continue. So it's a bleak outlook. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, now let's move on for some insights into what may be happening in the future. Uh, to that end, it's my privilege to now introduce Mike Catanzaro. Mike is President and Chief Policy Officer of CGCN. Mike has an illustrious career in senior energy and environmental policy positions across the federal government, including at the White House, EPA, the U.S. House of Representatives, the U.S. Senate. Uh, this included service as Special Assistant to President Trump for Domestic Energy and Environmental Policy on the White House Council, uh, National Economic Council. And uh, uh, most impressively, Mike has also been named as one of Washingtonian Magazine's 500 most influential people in Washington, D.C. So, Mike, uh, with that, the floor is yours. <laughs> you should have said that, John. <laughs> Well, no, thank you, John. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks to the Federal Society. Uh, it's great to be uh, on this panel with uh, friends and, and former colleagues uh, fighting uh, these policy battles over the years. Um, you know, I, I unfortunately, I share the view of uh, Commissioner Danley that the outlook is, is bleak um, in terms of where we're going. I mean, the head of or the title of this uh, event is permanent reform now or never. It's certainly not going to be now. We can't even get a Speaker of the House. Uh, I don't think it's going to be never, and I say that with some trepidation because I think in the previous two iterations with the IIJA and with the FRA, I think we got it wrong, and I can talk about that a little bit. But I do think we're going to get more permitting reform, and I say that for, for one reason, but there are other reasons. But one reason is I think the Democrats probably over time are going to come to the table uh, more than they have been, and I think they realize that the types of projects that they didn't think would run into problems in the permitting process are in fact running into problems in the permitting process. And there's actually a study which I commend to everyone in this room that just came out recently, I think, a professor of Stanford and a recent graduate of Stanford Law School, uh, the Environmental Law Institute, I think, put it out. Uh, the study looked at a data set of 355 major energy and infrastructure projects. And interestingly enough, in the data set, the projects that got most litigated were solar energy projects and transmission projects, wind energy projects. Of course, pipelines were on the list. Um, but I, I think all of that lends itself to the Democrats starting to say, maybe we ought to come to the table, maybe we ought to change, update some of these environmental laws that haven't really been meaningfully changed in well over 50 years. But how they do that and whether they're able to do that, given uh, the activists, the environmental activists uh, who are part of that party, whether they can do that or not is another question. But if the IRA uh, is to be at all successful in order to build out these projects, get them hooked up to the grid, you're going to have to reform the process that we currently have or it's simply not going to happen. Um, now, you think about permitting reform going forward, what do we have to do? I think the previous, as I said, the previous iterations missed the mark. And I can talk about what the mark is, but if you look at the IIJA, what Congress did is they took Congress didn't do what they're supposed to do, which is actually legislate and change laws. They took the one federal decision framework, which was part of an executive order in 2017, which I was part of in the Trump White House. We, we did that executive order because we knew Congress wasn't going to be involved. So we had to do the best that we could administratively, working with the powers that we had. And so we knew there were flaws in that process. Congress took the one federal decision framework, basically hook, line, and sinker, put it into a statute and said, this is it. And oh, by the way, it only applies to the Department of Transportation. I would argue that that process probably will make things worse, not better. And then when we look at the FRA, what was attempted, again, I think the intentions were good, but fell for, far short of the mark. As Commissioner Danley pointed out, uh, some of these terms, like reasonably foreseeable, were left undefined. So obviously, this CEQ uh, in its phase two NEPA proposal 
they're filling in the blanks. We'll see where that goes in court. Uh, but again, there's, the statute doesn't define some of these key terms. There are things in there, as Commissioner Danley said, page limits, but of course, you know, 150, 300 pages for an EIS, that's great, but of course it says accepted, you know, in terms of appendices, that doesn't count. So <laughs> we'll get 150 page EIS and thousands of pages of appendices. Uh, it has deadlines, uh, I don't think that works either, we can talk about that, but again, I think the intentions were good, but I'm very concerned about how this is being implemented and what it's gonna mean going forward for, for the permitting processes. In terms of what the mark is and how we can actually get it right, I think there's three things to think about. One is if we're not dealing with judicial review and judicial reform, litigation, then we might as well just go home because that is the issue. That is what plagues all of these projects is the fact that you go through these processes and you end up in court and you go round and round and round. The one thing I think Congress did get right in the FRA was they codified or allowed the Mountain Valley Pipeline to go forward and implicitly they understood that judicial review or litigation is the problem because they said Mountain Valley Pipeline going forward can't be litigated anymore. So unless you fix that, unless you restrict or again in the case of NEPA which is a procedural statute why we're suing it all is a question, unless you're doing that I don't think you're going to move the ball. I think the second point you have to remove bureaucratic uh, discretion and decision making as much as you possibly can. Again, the whole idea of deadlines, they'll always be gamed and they'll always find ways around it. The way I think you can get all of this is to go back to this first point is I don't think you're going to need deadlines if there's very clear going forward, if, if bureaucrats know they're not going to be sued, they're not going to then quote litigation proof their environmental impact statements. That is a common phenomenon, it's been well documented, and that's why these things run thousands of pages of long, long and take as long as they do. Again, I think the judicial review component of that or restricting it could solve a lot of that. And then the third component, of course, is taking on and amending uh, the environmental laws which haven't been updated in, in five decades in some cases. You have to do that, it has to be part of the process. So we'll see where that goes going forward. Again, unfortunately, I think a number of the bills that have been introduced, even among you know, the Republicans or some of the leaders, you know, again, they're sort of replete with deadlines and page limits and things of that nature. They don't really take on the litigation aspect in a very serious way, looking at how do you restrict uh, litigation under NEPA? How do you address litigation under the Administrative Procedure Act? That has to be addressed. I do think industry is coming to the table more and more on that with proposals. Uh, I think that's becoming kind of their number one ask going forward. I think this transmission issue is gonna be really, really important to a deal. Um, the question is, do we need more transmission in this country? Some would say yes, some would say no. I think it's interesting because the Democrats are not really talking about permitting reform in the transmission context. They're talking about things like cost allocation in terms of spreading the cost of building out interstate transmission lines, they're talking about further erosion of state authority over the right to site uh, transmission lines, but they're not really talking about other things. I mean, yes, if I suppose if you had some sort of cost allocation scheme that spread the cost and had the constituents of Wyoming paying for New York's offshore wind farms, um, that's great, but I don't think, think then all the pieces then fall into place and these lines then will get magically built. You're still gonna have all of these various laws in place and you'll still have the ability to go to court uh, seemingly endlessly. And if all of that is there, I just don't think the transmission lines get built. Again, coming back to my point, I think the Democrats are starting to come to the realization that they have to come to the table in a serious way, but I don't, don't know if they're gonna be able to do that anytime soon. So I think what we're gonna see over the next several months, next year, is a lot of continued discussion, debate, bills will be introduced. Senator Barrasso, who's the ranking member on the Senate Energy Committee, is right now working with Senator Manchin, who's the chairman of the Energy Committee, on a bipartisan permitting reform bill, which will potentially include some changes on transmission, there'll be some changes to the oil and gas leasing process, uh, some changes to FERC and uh, how they consider uh, 401 reviews in the states. So all of that will be potentially in that bill, that legislation will get introduced. I think right now, as I say, I don't know if the political will is there. It's gonna take a lot of time for this to play out. I think more and more as these projects, particularly as I said, solar and wind projects get stalled out, there's gonna have to be some deal in the works. Next year in a presidential election year, 
I don't think that happens. So you're going to see a lot of foundation laying for 2025 and whatever that may bring. If Republicans, you know, sweep in 2025, I think there will be a very vigorous attempt to try to get permitting reform across the finish line. Again, Democrats may be there along with them. We'll see. But um, again, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm worried about the future because again, I look at, you know, you, you don't know where you're going until you look at where you've been and where we've been is, is not in a great place. What we've done to date in the permitting reform effort, while the intentions have been good, the consequences have been not so good and uh, legislation not so great. So hopefully we can have sort of a, a reorienting of, of the minds up there. And again, I think overarching uh, reform has to be, we have to reform uh, the ability of activists to take bureaucrats and agencies and developers to court, because if you don't do that, you're really not solving the problem, so. Okay, great, Back. thank you, Mike. Appreciate those comments. So I wanna stay on the issue of the Builder Act for the moment, and as Commissioner Danley referenced, there is debate out there as to how much or little the Builder Act did or did not do, and um, as Commissioner Danley referenced, I'm, I'm actually on the record on behalf of a client in the D.C. Circuit taking the position that the Builder Act did make consequential changes to NEPA, and in particular, the call for agencies to look to the environment, to study the environmental impacts uh, of their decision, having been textually modified by the Congress uh, very significantly now to focus specifically on the environmental effects of the agency action, I'm referring, of course, to the agency action under consideration. And in particular, that modification picks up on the only a portion of the longstanding three parts effects test that was in the NEPA regulations and notably leaves out the cumulative effects a portion of that test. And in particular, that, you're, that, that agencies are to look at the cumulative effects of other agency actions by whoever those people are. So um, I've made the argument and I think that there is actually and has been a pretty significant narrowing in the scope of NEPA through the Builder Act. But Mary, you didn't really get a chance to comment on the Builder Act and your views of some of these issues and some of the changes that have happened. So I'd like to give you an opportunity to speak on, on that. And then uh, I wanna talk about the CEQ proposal. Yeah, so um, yeah, I think I might have a little bit different view than you both on, the, on some of the Builder Act uh, changes. I do think they're very significant. I think uh, the, the uh, uh, the page limits and the time limits are actually important. Um, there are, um, I think, uh, 170 or so. When we did, we looked at how many um, environmental documents were issued each year. There's something like 170 environmental impact statements, 10,000 environmental assessments, uh, um, maybe 100,000 categorical exclusion analyses that are done each year. And so, um, I think some uh, the um, there are many, many reviews. Uh, I think placing time limits is important because it gives expectations for all of the participants in the process that there is is a time limit. Uh, early in the um, early in the uh, development of CEQ's uh, initial regulations, the CEQ did say that the process for even the most complex environmental reviews uh, for the most complex energy projects shouldn't take more than one year. But in fact, the time, uh, the average time increased while we were there. We um, analyzed um, the time, time frames and it was an average of four and a half years for EIS, uh, over 600 pages in length. Uh, so I think that the time limits are important because they give an expectation that this isn't an open-ended process. And, and, and um, I think that's important for everybody in the process, whether it's the applicant has an expectation of how long it will take, the agencies know that they need to work together concurrently uh, to meet that schedule, and, um, and, and the other participants in the process know that they, they need to align with that schedule too. So I think the time limits are important. I also think the page limits are important because the whole purpose is to inform decision making, but if something is so long that it can't even be read by, um, it's very difficult for even the people within the agency to read it, let alone uh, others. It's 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 not an analysis that's going to necessarily inform inform the decision making process as well as it can. It's always harder to write something shorter, but it's um, it's it's I think it, it's it's an important. Um, an important change, and um, and these are presumptive, so there is flexibility to 
uh, increase the time limits or the page limits, but it's also important to have, have a framework to work in, I think. Uh, and so one thing the Builder Act did do, and I'm, I'm Mike and, and, and Commissioner, is it installed a private right of action for those seeking to pursue uh, permits and authorizations, yeah. right? So previously, the way that the legal regime was, work, was w worked out is you had NEPA, which on its face doesn't have a private right of action, and, mm -hmm. and many people have argued was supposed to be entirely to the discretion of the agencies, a um, please do this, think about this, but um, was never contemplated that you would end up with anywhere near the amount of litigation that's gr gr uh, grown yeah. from that. That litigation, of course, derives from the Administrative Procedures Act, not the statute itself. Now within the statute, there actually is, for the first time, surprisingly, notwithstanding the thousands of NEPA cases that there are, uh, a private right of action, but the private right of action actually runs to the, the, those who are seeking the permits and the authorizations and the like. So, I mean, one question I have for both of you. It is a real problem because the, the, this is like the old, the old uh, uh, principle from equity, right? No, no, basically, you have no right without a remedy, and what is the remedy that can possibly be granted? Just like with the page limits, we won't rehash that, we've had the back and forth, but with time limits, you can, you can acknowledge that every bureaucrat in government will act according to the interests that they have, just like every human acts according to their interests for what is right in front of them at that moment. And if you were, in, we, had a, we had a private right of action before in the, in the sense that if it had been eight years, you could file for an All Writs Act action if you wanted one. And if the agency is in receipt of one, the response is, oh my gosh, now I have changed my priority from dealing with whatever it is I was dealing with to the fact that we're about to be hauled into court. I know how we can get rid of this uh, petition for writ of mandamus. You get on the phone, you call the guy who has the draft order, and you say, print out a copy, leave the, the, the marginal comments in, leave the red line, it doesn't matter. We are issuing this thing as is. Have fun trying to defend that when you intervene, is what you say to the project proponent. You want your order? Here it is. The problem is, as long as we have judicial review, and this is the point that Mike made, as long as we have ju judicial review along the lines that we do now, none of these procedural mechanisms will make any difference to the actual durability of the orders, and it is the lack of legal durability, not the timelines at which government acts, that actually adds that risk premium that makes it impossible to develop infrastructure, and it, it fundamentally will not help. Expectations are one thing. But, but the agencies are going to take the time that they're going to take in order to achieve the objective they have, which is to bulletproof the orders on review. And, and I will say, well, first off, I mean, the Builder Act made a fundamental mistake in that, it, it's funny, if you go and look at the 1978 Carter regs and you line it up with the Builder Act, it's a, lot, a lot of it's the same. And the problem is, is they didn't go back the original statute, which really doesn't say much. So we're basically working off the 78 regs, which made up a lot of stuff that's not in NEPA. But in any case, in terms of the, the time limits, uh, Mary mentions flexibilities, but I mean, you can drive a truck through those. I mean, essentially it says, if you run it up against a two-year deadline, uh, an agency can go to the project developer and say, you know, we need more time. I would basically guarantee that just about every project developer is like, okay, I'll give you mm -hmm. more time, because there's that dynamic with your regulator, you don't want to upset it. And then it says, well, then you can take your regulator to court if they miss the two-year deadline. I don't think they're gonna take their regulator to court. I mean, maybe if it gets to three years, possibly. But then, okay, great, you're in court. <laughs> and then the judge says, well, okay, you missed the deadline. Now you need to go back, and there's a certain time period in which you have to go back and, and then fix the remedy and, and get the EIS completed. Okay, well then the activist groups will come in and sue you. <laughs> so then you're back in court again. So I don't think the two year, and then again, as, as Commissioner Danley said, um, two years, can they focus minds? Yes, but because they're gonna focus minds, bureaucrats have a vested interest in making sure they can shift a lot of the work prior to your NOI up front, which doesn't count into the clock. And I think that, again, the system can be gamed. And, and unless you're, again, you're telling bureaucrats who are writing these that you're not gonna be sued at the end of this process when you're writing your EIS, then I think you're going to shorten these documents. Again, the page limits, as I said, you're going to have 300 pages for an EIS and thousands of pages of appendices. You haven't solved the problem. And even if you take the appendices issues out and say it's just 300 pages, no more, no less, okay, well, that's still, you could still take three years or four years or five years to write a 300 page document. So again, I don't think any of that helps. As I said, what you have to do is restrict, remove bureaucratic discretion in the process as much as you possibly can. Congress needs to be very clear about automatically approving things. And unless you're doing that, I don't think you're gonna solve the problem. Okay, let's move on and talk about the 
new proposal that came out from the from the CEQ on July 31st, 2023. So they issued a, a proposed phase two NEPA reform regulation and take public comment. In their public statements and presentations, the CEQ said that the goals of the proposed rule are to quote, implement the NEPA amendments in the Fiscal Responsibility Act, provide an efficient and effective environmental review process. So I'm gonna open this one up to the panel. Um, and uh, look for any reactions on the proposed rules and how uh, anyone believes that the new proposals will achieve or not achieve those stated goals. I'll just start. Um, sure. You know, I think um, there are very extensive revisions in the, in the proposal. Uh, what I always go back to um, is, you know, are, are, the, are the changes practical and are they implementable by, um, by agency officials? And I think that um, many of the, the changes may, may not be as practical or implementable. Um, uh, uh, they may not clarify, but rather um, you know, um, make it less clear what, what the agency should do and uh, how uh, extensive or or not extensive when when it it's um it's to me um, I think it's always just very important to think about this as a practical uh, having really practical um, approaches are the best and um, really necessary because you have so many officials across the country implementing this statute they need to know um, what the framework is what what uh, what they are expected to do and and analyze and uh, the more layers and um, uh, requirements and sort of um, uh, lack of clarity the the more difficult it is for them to to carry out their duties yeah and i don't want to put you on the spot mary but it did occur to me as i was reading the proposed rule that this must have been a little bit of a surreal experience for you because there was a lot of debating with the prior CEQ and I'm sitting there, you know, imagining mm -hmm. myself in your <laughs> shoes, right, as they're, you know, writing about CEQ said this and we don't think that that was the right. And so mm -hmm. is there, were there any uh, changes that you made and, and that they kind of undid that you thought kind of st stood out in particular um, as, you know, uh, a move in the less reformist direction? Well, I think you know perhaps the most striking really was what has been raised already. The um, the, the uh, we had clarified that um, consistent with the case law that this is a procedural statute that uh, that's really the focus of of um, the environmental review provisions in NEPA, and um, I think um, that. Um, that's that was a, a section that, I, that that was a general there were general changes throughout that that um, tended to maybe uh, make it a little less clear um, for people who have to implement that that this is a procedural statute and that uh, it's very important that they prepare an analysis that can help inform decision making but doesn't dictate it an outcome so I, I, can, I, I don't have that much more to add. I completely agree that it seems to uh, be not even aimed at the purported purpose. The, the new regime seems to be more cumbersome and less clear. And of course, whenever there are new issuances, there then has to be the back and forth of trying to figure out how to actually implement them. And wrestling over whether these changes have the, the uh, profundity that they, they seem to, or they, you know, basically a recodification would have been there. I, I don't. I, I don't think it's going to make anything easier for anybody. Mike, further thoughts? Yeah, you know it's interesting. I I, I don't want to I don't want to bash on the, on the Builder Act, but it, there was an exchange in a hearing which was interesting to me. Um, Brendan Mallory, who's the the chair of, of CEQ, was before the House Resources Committee, and Garrett Graves, who's one of the authors of Builder Act, Builder Act, said, um, you know, Chair Mallory, uh, we passed this legislation and made these reforms. And so, you know, what do you think of them? And she basically said, thank you, Congressman Grace, because you've essentially codified um, the longstanding practices of, of CEQ and its interpretations of NEPA. And he, Garrett Grace, was very outraged by that. But I, I, I think Brenda Mallory had a point. And so when you read through the preamble in the phase two proposal, there's a lot of that type of rhetoric saying, thank you, Congress. 
Um, you essentially allowed us to do what we want to do uh, here, which is effectively at bottom, they're putting the thumb on the scale to make sure that NEPA favorably um, uh, review, you have favorable reviews for renewable energy projects for the projects this administration wants to see go through and unfavorably puts the thumb on the scale for fossil fuel projects. And NEPA in no way contemplates that, either when it was passed and signed into law in 1970 or the Builder Act changes uh, this year. So that's effectively what I think they're trying to do uh, with this phase two proposal. And we'll see what happens when we go to court uh, with all of that. But um, uh, again, as, as Mary rightly said, it's gonna make the process more complicated and uh, less efficient, unfortunately. Well, great. Well, thank you uh, to our panel. And I think we've got about 15 minutes left on the programming. So I thought it would be uh, good to open the, up to questions. And I saw one right, right here um, in the front, first hand up. Um, Myron, if you want to grab the microphone. Thank you. Uh, Myron Ebel, CEI. Uh, I, on the question of now or never, I just want to vote for never. Uh, <laughs> And uh, it seems to me that the only solution to NEPA and to the problem with reforming the underlying environmental statutes is to first repeal NEPA. Uh, it just needs to go. There's no way to reform it. Once that's done, this supposedly procedural statute can no longer hide all of the problems with the underlying environmental statutes, and then we might have a chance to uh, reform or repeal the Endangered Species Act, et cetera. So that would be my question to you. Don't you think that's actually a better way to go? Uh, repealing NEPA would get rid of a lot of uh, legal uncertainty for a lot of projects that are being proposed, that's for sure. I do think that you will accomplish much of the same objective uh, uh, that I've been you know, calling for here by, by removing reviewability altogether. You don't necessarily have to get it off the books altogether if, it is, if it's not reviewable or, or has a high enough standard of review. You can probably accomplish 90% of what I'm after. What you're after, which is pulling the curtain open and seeing other statutes as they're implemented, that I, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm curious if either of my colleagues yeah. up here. No, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you know, NEPA is referred to by some as the Magna Carta of environmental law, which I think is a misunderstanding of Magna Carta and NEPA at the same time. Because <laughs> um, it's not that. And of course, in the phase two proposal, let's say NEPA is the basic charter of, of the nation's environmental laws. I, again, I just don't agree with that. And of course, NEPA, as I said, was signed into law by President Nixon on January 1st, 1970. And it was before we had all sort of the major environmental statutes that uh, we know today and that have made the United States uh, the most environmentally uh, protective country in terms of its laws. And uh, the results, of course, have been uh, profound and we're not looking to overturn any of those acts. But the question is, is NEPA really, to Myron's point, is it needed uh, now that we have, you know, we passed all those statutes in the 70s? Um, one wonders. I mean, if you're looking at, for example, the Army Corps of Engineers when they're issuing a 404 permit, I mean, they do all kinds of analysis just on the 404 separate and apart from NEPA to determine whether it's needed or not. And they would do that anyway, even if you didn't have NEPA there. So the question is, would that ever, you know, can you get rid of NEPA? I, I don't think so. I think it's there to stay for the very, very long haul. Um, and that's, we'll just have to deal with it and try to change it as best as best we can. Next question from the audience. I don't know, Nate, if we have the ability to get any questions online or fed up here or not, but sometimes that's a source of them, but go ahead. Uh, Justin Schwab, CGCN Law. I'm gonna throw out three, all very brief, I promised, and then the panel can respond to whatever they want. One, who says CEQ has any regulatory authority of any kind, <laughs> whether to bind other agencies or to bind outside parties, <clears throat> one. Two, how is anybody going to show standing and ripeness to bring a facial challenge to the CEQ revision when it's finalized? Three, is there a major questions play at issue with the, trans the attempt to transform NEPA into a transformative rather than an informational and procedural vehicle? Take any or, any or none of those if you want. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask Mary to take question one since, it was, so, since she was wielding that authority at one period of time. But I'm going to take question two myself, <laughs> since it was my position on behalf of the United States government <laughs> and, the, and the Department of Justice that no one did have standing to challenge the initial rule that was promulgated by CEQ. And I still haven't seen any arguments mm -hmm. uh, that, I, that convinced me, uh, in part because 
you got to remember what CEQ's regulations are, which is they are guidance of sort, or maybe not even regulation, um, but for other federal agencies. And until such time as the federal other federal agencies begin to act on what it is that the CEQ has put out there, uh, where is your concrete and particularized injury that's traceable to the mere issuance of guidance that has not yet been implemented? So it uh, doesn't mean that it's dispositive and no one can come up with an argument, uh, but, uh, but I do think that the, the hurdle is high. We successfully defended uh, uh, Mary's rule uh, during my time at the Justice Department on those grounds, and no one challenged the phase one uh, modification by the Biden administration CEQ, uh, I think because of anticipating those issues. But, uh, you know, we'll never say never necessarily. But then, Mary, so um, were, was what you were doing merely advisory, or did you have any uh, particular authority from Congress to do it? Well, I think that we, um uh, our view was that the, our authority came from the president, um, a component of the White House, and um, uh, this issue has been raised in, in uh, at least one court decision, I think, where there's been some commentary on that. Uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier was that the CQ regulations have gone to the Supreme Court, I think, 17 times at least, um, uh, and uh, including the one revision in 1986 that was made actually went to the, the Supreme Court. So. Um, there seems to have been a long-standing recognition that there's authority um, to move forward with regulation. Yeah, and I'll note in the one concurrence that came out recently uh, in the D.C. Circuit that questioned CEQ's authority, there was not actually a citation to uh, the Supreme Court decisions that seemed to accept the premise, and we don't know if it was argued, um, but seemed to accept the premise that CEQ had authority to issue rules uh, that would have uh, binding effect, but certainly I don't think that that question has really been thoroughly explored and uh, remains outstanding. So, um, Mike, James, anything else on? I, I mean, I would just say, uh, setting aside this question of whether CQ can issue regulations or not, I guess I have my own views on it, but you know, we need to go back to the fact that in 19, I mean, a lot of the problems we deal with with NEPA go back to the 1978 Carter regulations. and. Uh, as I say, a lot of these terms, concepts were made up out of whole cloth. And then based off of that, we have court decisions uh, that sort of reinforced all of that. And again, I, I think set the regulations aside. We have to go back to the basic statute. I mean, what was passed was essentially, I think it was five pages long, maybe half a page, section 102, 2C is really the only part of it that matters. Talking about detailed statements for major federal actions that significantly affect the quality of the human environment four or five criteria about what should be in that, and that's it. And the rest of the statute was, you know, dicta, florid dicta, but dicta nonetheless, the equivalent of congressional findings. So at the end of the day, there's, there's not much there, but these regulations, and again, the 2020 regs were trying to get back to kind of that original understanding, so they were necessary. But again, the CEQ, I, I wonder if we should continue down this road, because um, in some respects, some could argue, some could argue that maybe these regulations are creating more confusion going forward, and then maybe we need to think about this, but I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Another question over here. Thank you for coming. I am not an expert in this field, but two quick questions and answer either, both or none. Uh, the first is in the exalted circles in which I travel, there's a lot of interest in nuclear which is the only solution to the climate crisis from my understanding and is also perhaps the most buried projects under an avalanche of unnecessary regulation. If any of you follow that, is the outlook for nuclear becoming slightly less bleak or more bleak under the uh, past couple of years? And the other question is, all right, so suppose you're advising a client as to how to get your project through. I mean, occasionally things are greenlit. Occasionally we have a new plant or a new, uh, new infrastructure. Obviously, the Mountain Valley people got their lobbying correct. Uh, what's the secret sauce? Is it going to the right court, buying off the interest groups? I mean, how, is, how do you manage to, uh, how are people managing to succeed when they do? 
Nuclear. Well, quite, quite, yeah. Quite. Uh, yeah. So on the, fir on the first question, um, uh, yeah. I mean, I think uh, sort of separate from the discussion today, but the um, nuclear is a is a um, has the the prospects are are seem quite bright uh, for nuclear going forward. Uh, this is one area where there is a lot of bipartisan support, both for the continued operation of the existing fleet and also for the next generation of nuclear reactors. And so there's a lot of um, a lot of strong support for uh, for nuclear as a key part of the portfolio because of its reliability and um, the importance of, of uh, reliable, dependable 24-hour uh, power. And um, uh, so um, uh, so that I think that's the answer. It, it is um, uh, uh, certainly something that a lot of people are interested in and very supportive of going forward on both sides of the aisle. Uh, uh, like every other, pro like, like all other projects, um, they are, their projects are subject to NEPA and the NRC implements NEPA, uh, as does DOE in some instances in connection with uh, support for the nuclear industry. But um, that's what I would say on, on your first question. <laughs> So on the on the topic of, of nuclear, um, you know, Commissioner, you know, how has NEPA uh, impacted nuclear power development in particular? Is there any differential effect that you perceive, or is it? Um, I mean, you know, it's, certainly your authority is over the the rates for the transportation, mm -hmm. but in terms of how right. you're seeing the interconnection going more broadly, uh, um, the, I mean, I, I'm I am not an expert on nuclear power development or anything like that, so take what I say with a grain of salt. It doesn't seem as though there are a sufficient number of actual cases that I could tell you how NEPA is variantly affecting nuclear power. The, 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 the issue is the initial, I think, the initial permitting regime at the, the NRC primarily and the general unwillingness to, to uh, <laughs> risk the, the inevitable litigation of all types, not merely under NEPA, that's going to attend any kind of a, a project that goes forward. That's my guess, but I, I'm not. I'm not sufficiently well informed to really be certain. I, I, on the on the second point, you, you say what's the secret? You 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 reference Mountain Valley Pipeline, and it's necessary to understand that that was a, a, a special set of circumstances: a greenfield, very large infrastructure project, with a lot of sunk costs and a lot of expectations already forward for all infrastructure in all types, but I'm particularly, I'm particularly well aware of how it is for energy infrastructure. What's happening is uh, developers are accommodating themselves to the risks of their business as they grow with all this litigation. And so instead of having large greenfield projects being developed, the projects that are being proposed to the extent that they are, are much smaller. They are, uh, in the case of transmission, instead of large uh, lines crossing multiple jurisdictions, there are local upgrades that are being conducted, but that are being developed by the transmission owners. And so I don't know that there is a, a solution the way you're talking about. I can say that people respond to the signals they're getting by the, the, the agencies, the judiciary, and the marketplace, and they have much smaller ambitions than they have had historically. So one common theme that's <clears throat> gone th down the panel back and forth uh, throughout today's discussion is litigation and litigation risk and how that has really driven the process and made it more cumbersome and more difficult. So um, Mike, at different points during your comments and then you know, Commissioner Danley here talking about the NRC, obviously permitting reform and permitting is about more than just NEPA. Um, and there are all kinds of statutes that are at issue, right? Is there, uh, should there be a call for broader litigation reform generally as it relates to permitting and why, and why are we so focused on NEPA? And what about all these other statutes which are suffering from similar um, concerns uh, in terms of getting infrastructure uh, and economic development going? Yeah, I, I, it's a great question, John. And I, I do think on judicial reform and litigation reform in the context of, of permitting, you're going to start, my expectation is you're going to start hearing a lot more about that because I, I do think, you know, industry as they're trying to get a sense of the implications and the consequences of the FRA and what the administration CEQ is doing with this next round of, of NEPA regs. They're thinking, okay, if we're actually going to go back to the Hill, what are the one or two things that we really need? 
and, and again, litigation is going to be, I think, top of that list. But these other statutes are just sitting there as well. And uh, you know, the Endangered Species Act, Section 7 consultations take forever. It's a huge problem. Um, Clean Water Act, Section 401, we know if you're trying to build an interstate gas pipeline, it can be a huge problem. So those things are absolutely going to be in play. Again, um, you know, Senator Capito has the Restart Act, which addresses a lot of these things. So uh, again, I think this, this next round is going to be really interesting to watch because of all the different dynamics that I talked about. But um, I do feel like Republicans especially are starting to understand how really important uh, getting changes to litigation. And, and some have seen some drafts of some legislation that are trying to get at this standing question. So for example, if you are someone who is a hiker or you're canoeing down a river and you don't aesthetically like the fact that 100 miles away they're building a pipeline, can you go to court based off, off of that? Are you being harmed in some way? Some on the Hill are saying maybe we ought to change that. Really, the, the standing question should be about you have to demonstrate palpable sort of economic harm to your property or something along those lines that only then can you really go to court those ideas are being bandied about whether or not they'll get political salience and momentum behind them or not, I don't know. But all of the things that you're talking about are definitely going to be on the table in this next round. Mary? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I, they, uh, you know, one of the things about NEPA is that it's sort of a, an umbrella statute in a way, and underneath it, as you're doing your NEPA analysis, you are doing other analyses under other laws, and um, it's, it's, they are, there's, an awful lot of, um, of um, uh, complexity around around these reviews because of the the substantive statutes that are underneath that also need to be reviewed. So, um, you know, it's it's a it's a very challenging and complex world um, when you're talking about permitting and and uh, for many of the really significant projects, they're going to a lot of those statutes are going to come into play. I, th I think that's actually the 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 answer that John is looking for. It is because you conduct your consultations, for example, in the context of your NEPA procedure, and then NEPA is reviewed under a very uh, low threshold, and so it presents the most appealing target in order to challenge the issuance, and it's because NEPA is the umbrella that covers all of the, the other statutory obligations. That's the reason. It's a target-rich environment. It is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Especially the longer the, anal the, the, the analytical documents get and the more comments that, that allow people to point out errors that then are not satisfactorily uh, explored in the, in the final EIS. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, unless we don't have further questions from the audience, I want to thank all the members of our panel here for joining us today in the discussion. And I want to th also thank the Federalist Society. A round of applause for our panelists. And <laughs> for hosting this event. Yes, thank you to our audience for their um, attendance today. Excellent questions. Really appreciated the excellent panel and the discussion, and especially at the Federal Society points of disagreement. Obviously, the uh, conversation will continue, uh, but we are adjourned, and thank you very much. Thank you.